Hello, and welcome to another episode of Motels. I'm Dave's minion, Kuda Pete, and today will be third in our series of what was involved with the manufacturing and supply of car parts to Chrysler Corporation in the mid-1980s. We previously went over engineering and supplier quality. Today, we will look more at material handling. So we're at the point where the parts are produced and they're ready to go out the door. Can the supplier just throw them in a box and ship them to the plant? No. There were specifications for that too. And they were called out in the packaging and shipping instruction manual. And this manual provided specific instructions on how parts were to be packed and shipped to the assembly plant so they could be installed on the cars in the most efficient and economic manner possible. So the first thing is when you were shipping the parts, you wanted to try and minimize the chance of damage. So the trucks were to be loaded so that maybe the heaviest parts were on the bottom and the lightest parts were on the top. Something, something like loading your grocery cart, you want to keep the heavier items on the bottom and the lighter items like bread on the top. You don't want to get out and get home and have your bread all smushed. It doesn't work good that way. The same with car parts. You want them to arrive at the plant in good usable condition. So the second thing about standardized packaging was at the time, there was beginning to use automatic guided vehicles in the plants, or AGVs. And these AGVs could only be programmed to accept certain size boxes or cartons or containers consistently. So it was very important that things were packed the same time after time in the same type of packaging so that the AGVs could be used to deliver them to the proper places on the assembly line. Also, from the economic side, reusable containers, racks, pallets, bins, and boxes were encouraged. So this way, they could be returned to the supplier and reused another time instead of being disposed of. So the boxes may be designed to be stackable or collapsible, or in some way, easy to return to the supplier so that they could be reused. If they were going to be a corrugated box, they were standards for that too, so that the box would not collapse or fall apart when it was being unloaded or moved around the plant. So it was very important that these standards be met and that the trucks be loaded properly so that a lot of economies and efficiencies could be realized that way because just-in-time delivery and just-in-time manufacturing were starting to take hold in the industry at, at that point, and it was critical that parts arrived at the, assembly ta- at the assembly plant when they were needed to avoid production delays. Secondly, when the parts got to the plants, it was important to be able to identify them. So Chrysler came up with the shipping parts Identification Label Standards Manual. In this manual, it defined the size and placement of shipping labels on these containers. So you always wanted the shipping label to be in the same location, you always wanted it to be the same size, and you wanted all your shipping labels to contain certain information, such as the part number, the lot number, it's actually in the box, so that anybody could go up to that box and quickly identify what it was, where it was supposed to be. So that was important for efficiency also. And the other thing that was coming into play at the time was barcode. So barcode standards had to be developed so that once something got into the plant, it could be quickly identified using a barcode and that that didn't hold up things as well. So at the time, because of just-in-time delivery, just-in-time manufacturing, it was very important that things be packaged properly, consistently, and identified properly in consistency, so to be as efficient and as economical as possible. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And if you have any comments, please leave them below. And I thank you very much for watching.